All right. What I'm doing today, we're going to cover the first parts of Genesis, the first books in the Bible. This is something I've struggled with for years, years, years. I've been through so many classes, uh, shepherd school, discipleship courses, could never get good answers to my questions in Genesis. I finally kind of had my moment, uh, kind of like uh, Buddha when he sat down under the banyan tree and said, that's it, I'm not budging until you know I figure this out. That's kind of what I did, except I did it on my couch. <laughs> so, you know, I just prayed and, and went off, off the range. I didn't care what I'd been taught before. I didn't care if it conflicted with doctrine. I didn't care. I wanted the truth. And uh, God opened it up to me. It took about two years of reading uh, thousands of pages of other ancient manuscripts and things. And, uh, well, uh, interpretations of those. I didn't have those manuscripts. But, you know, and I just feel like this is the foundation where... You know, it's like, uh, why do I need to know who the four horsemen in the apocalypse are if I can't understand the first chapter of the Bible? <laughs> I mean, why am I going there? And that's what people do. So we're going to lay the foundation today. This will not be like anything you've ever heard in Sunday school or probably any church. And, you know, I'm sorry, but I feel like this is the truth. And... Uh, we're going to dive in here. First, I want to say this. I'm going to quote the Apostle Paul. If I can find it. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We're eating meat today. This is not milk. This is the real deal. This is, I'm throwing out a big slab of meat today. <laughs> and it's going to be a little lengthy because really all I'm covering is more or less the first verse first chapter in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth to get clear back around to explain just those few words we have to look at the first two chapters of the bible now let me clarify this that there's a lot of people that say you know we have the pure inerrant uh, word of God in the Bible. It's never been changed, and it's been preserved forever. I have a very hard time with that. Uh, the I love the Bible. There's a lot there. It's a great book. It's a holy book, but to think that in this day we still have untouched words is just not possible. And the Bible is a condensed version of more ancient uh, versions of more ancient Sumerian versions that's been condensed, it's been rewritten. Our English Bible, I mean, well, let me back up even before that. When the Jews came out of captivity and they could no longer speak Hebrew, which was the original language of the Old Testament, they had to have the Essenes rewrite the Bible. Um, and a side note, uh, most people think the Essenes are the ones, the Jews, that trained Jesus. But uh, So they had to rewrite it at that point. Uh, when King James, when it was going to print, to print the King James Bible, he turned the whole manuscript, all that, over to uh, Sir Francis Bacon for almost a year to uh, take a look at it. Um, make changes, do whatever. Nobody really knows what he did with it for a whole year. <laughs> I mean, so how do we think that we still have the pure words that were originally written down? 
And just another side note, Sir Francis Bacon, if you know anything about him, was very into these secret uh, doctrines. He had two whole sets of alphabet where you had to use a magnifying glass to see if a T had a little curl on it. Because if it did, then that T wasn't really a T, it was an F or whatever, and all these things. So, my God, I mean, it, it goes on and on. But let's, let's, let's get into this. That, and, and here's the other thing. The, the Bible is so condensed that if you, if you let the Bible stand on its own and try to decipher these things, you do not have enough information to do it. You have to compare, uh, there's this thought, compare scripture to scripture, but they compare scriptures in the Bible to other script, uh, scripture in the Bible. You need to compare scripture in the Bible to other scriptures, other Hindu scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, ancient Chinese scriptures. If you start looking at all these things, ancient Egyptian scriptures, you start seeing uh, a similar picture emerge about creation, that it all coincides, it all lines up real nice, and you don't have to look like an idiot and say that, you know, a day is a literal day and, and these things, which makes the earth uh, 6,004 years old, I think, or whatever, which is ridiculous. I've got stuff in the back of my refrigerator that's older than that. I mean, so, but I'm going to break down the, the first verse of Genesis is in the beginning. So here we have the concept of time. So we're going to cover that. God, we're going to cover that. Created the heaven and the earth, and we're going to cover that. So really, we've got kind of three Thanks. Right at the, I mean, and the order of the Bible is no accident. This is our foundation for spiritual work, for studying the Bible. It's right here in the first verses of the Bible. So if you don't get this down and you're trying to figure out revelation, how you, you know, I mean, so here we go. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So in the beginning, so we have this concept of time. There was a beginning. And the Bible doesn't say any more really about this. This is a concept that, you know, we had uh, uh, earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. All your other creation stories that I've read, I've looked at American Indian stories, creation stories too, they all had this same similar theme of a dark uh, mass of watery substance and then light moved upon this and, and creation started. Now, if we go to the Hindus, they've got the most detailed records I could find. I mean, they, they put it, numbers to it. I mean, oh my word, I mean... And, uh, but here's the thing, they, the, when you look at the Hindus, and I, I'm claiming it's right here in the Bible, that you've got six days of creation and one day of rest. Well, when you read the Hindu uh, versions, they look at it as huge cycles. They call them yugas. And uh, we're in the Kali Yuga, I believe, right now, or whatever. So this goes on endlessly. So when this says, in the beginning, that's the beginning of this round, not an absolute beginning. It's endless. It's infinite. So if, if our Bible said, and on day eight, God did this, I think it would say on day eight, God created the heaven and the earth. It would all start over again. It's just a huge endless cycle. So... And then to cover this uh, idea of a day, God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. This is not a literal day. This is in God's terms. This is not our terms. This is God. And we can't get inside God's mind, I mean, and know his thoughts. His thoughts are way above our thoughts, you know. We can't comprehend it, but we, we get a good glimpse here but all this is is a period of time. A day is a period of time. 
and how long it is, why don't we leave that up to the scientists? Why do we have to argue with evolutionists? Uh, there was evolution. And it did take, in our terms, it took billions of years for, for these things to happen. In, in God's terms, it's simultaneous. I mean, and it could just as easily say, instead of saying, and, and that was the first day, it could say, and then God did that. And then next he did this, and then next he did this. And when you look at it that way, it totally, totally lines up with scientists and evolutionists. And you don't have to go have some stupid debate where a Christian stands up here and beats a pulpit and says the Bible says a day, that means a day. It means a period of time. It doesn't mean a literal day in our terms. It, it's in God's terms. So there's sort of your concept of time is it's infinite, it's limitless, and a day is not a literal day. It's just showing the order that how things evolve, how they happen. And uh, so that, that sort of covers the idea of the time here. Now, as we look at the, the word God, and, and here again, <sighs> Genesis, the first five books of the Bible are Hebrew, Hebrew books, Jewish. They don't get any more Jewish than this. But Christians have lat latched on to it, put it in their Christian Bible, and I love Christians, and that's what I've grown up as, but I can't, I can't remember his name, but to quote, semi-quote, a rabbi, he said, you know, if the Christians want to use our books, at least they should learn to use them intelligently. So that's another place I've looked deeply is into uh, more ancient Hebrew texts and the Kabbalah texts, which expound on these ideas. They're the ones that wrote these books. Why do we not look to them to explain it? So, right off, so we've got this term God, G-O-D, God. And in the first chapter, they use this word 35 times. In the beginning, God created, God moved, God said, God saw, God divided, God called, God said, God made, God called. It's always God, G-O-D. What is that word in Hebrew? It's Elohim. This is a compound word. One half is male, one half is female. It's plural, which this causes a real problem for Christians. With your monotheistic God, I'm not saying that's not right, but this is a very plural term. And so when we use the word God, we've downgraded and missed so much of the meaning of this. This is, and, and you see, Specifically, and, and of course you hear this question all the time over here uh, um, where God's creating man, uh, let us, plural, make man in our image, plural, again, uh, it's a plural term, and it's male and female. It's not just a man up here doing these things. I'm sorry. It's both. God is male and female. He's all-inclusive. It's it's, you know, um, so here, here, here's what I'm getting at here. So we have the term Elohim, and, and when you look at these other, uh, you look at the Egyptians, they called them the builders. The Hebrews called it the Elohim. They always associated the number seven, like somehow it's divided into seven uh, beings, or uh, again, how can we explain this? It's a, it's, a, it's a lofty concept, but it's a plural. And uh, so these are uh, considered the creators. Like, and you look into some of the old Egyptian things, they'll show them with a sword carving out the universe out of this primordial mass of black stuff, you know, and they're creating planets. And... Uh, so let me get back around here to this. So the whole first chapter, and I'm going to, this is something I have not read anywhere, but in my study, I decided, uh, 
Well, it's a fact that in, in the Hebrew, the, there is no punctuation, there's no chapter verse, there's, and, and you know, you read right to left. So as we go through the creation story after day six, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So in the, I've got a King James Bible. So right there, that's the end of chapter one. I take um, argument with that because now we've still got day seven. Why is that not included in chapter one? And thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them. It just makes sense that this should continue on and include the next three verses. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And because that in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Bam. That should be the end of the first chapter. I'm sorry. Right there. That's the end of this thought. And this is poetry. People don't understand how much of the Bible, some say as much as 75% of the Bible is poetry. And if anybody uh, here is a songwriter, a poet, anything like, you don't word things the same way when you're writing a poet as you would in a textbook. You want to be eloquent with your words. You're using words so to, to, so to wind up a thought and say, you know, and the evening and the day were the fourth day. That sounds great in poetry. That doesn't mean it's a literal day. It means the, it's poetry. And it doesn't mean there's not truth there, but you have to understand how to look at this. And, uh, and uh, uh, back to this, uh, on the, the resting part of God, why does God have to rest? I've, had, I've taught kids for years, and I've had that, why did God have to rest on the seventh day? Was he tired? <laughs> what, <laughs> what this is, again, if you look to the Hebrews, they call it the breathing in and the breathing out. When God breathes out, creation happens. When God breathes in, he rests. Everything goes back to this primordial mass and, and gets swallowed up into the bosom of the mother again. And, and it's a time of rest. And then God bring, breathes out again and creation happens again. It's a breathing in, it's a breathing out. So, in that sense, God does rest. I mean, it, it's not like he ta lays down and takes a nap, but again, I mean, we don't understand the loftiness or, or how God operates. But we have the best view of God's mind and how he works right here in the first two chapters. So, let me show you why I, I say that. So the whole first, and I'm, again, I'm taking uh, the liberty to call uh, verse 3 of chapter 2 the actual end of uh, chapter 1. And uh, so we've got the term God, Elohim, 35 times. And now chapter 2 starts, and these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God. It's gone from God to Lord God. And the whole second chapter, it's always Lord God. It's never God, it's Lord God. Why do I make a deal out of that? Again, go to the Hebrew. Lord God in Hebrew is this, uh, you see, when you see it written, it's J-H-V-H, uh, and you have to fill in the vowels. And supposedly, even the Hebrews don't know the correct pronunciation for this. So we say uh, Yahweh or Jehovah, but it's changed. We've gone from the whole first chapter that God made, God saw, God said, God created, God blessed. And now all of a sudden, chapter 2, it's Lord God. It's Jehovah. And Jehovah made, Je Jehovah had, Jehovah formed, Jehovah planted, Jehovah to grow. And, and the whole, the whole, uh, the first chapter is such high uh, prose or, or poetry. It's beautiful, I mean, when you look at it. And now it, it's like we've taken, an, it's almost like it wasn't even written by the same person. 
Now, these are the, it's like we've gone from poetry back to a textbook. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And on and on, you know, and then we get down here to, uh, and now man's created out of dust. We're down to dirt. We're talking about gold. We're talking, which lands have uh, bedillium and onyx stones and uh, the names of certain rivers. You know, the, the whole thing has come down to a, a lot lower level of uh, wording. It's just not the same. Why is that? Well, let me tell you why that is. The whole first chapter of Genesis is not the physical creation of the universe. This is the Elohim in his way and his, his and her mind set, setting the format for creation. And this gives us the exact, we're created in God's image. Is this not how we do everything? Everything starts with a thought. You don't just, Andrew here, he's an engineer. Do you, do, is the first thing when you build something, you go buy all the materials? No. You start with a thought. You get the architects, the engineers. You plan it. The Elohim were the, the engineers of the universe. They just laid it out. They didn't create it. They created the format. They put it in into, uh, what's the word I want? I mean, they, they laid out the, the, they, cre the, they engineered it. They, they, uh, arc they were the architects of the engineer, of, of the universe. Now, Lord God, Jehovah, did the actual creation. And when you look at, at these first two chapters this way, it actually starts to make a little more sense. It's like, okay, wait, wait. Verse 27, God already created man. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And this is, of course, interesting. Male and female created he him. So that creation of man was the same as God, male and female. These were not separate entities. And these weren't physical entities. These were spiritual. And they were male and female both. Until chapter 2, where Jehovah started creating uh, the universe and created man, now man got made out of dirt. And what happened? There's no female. So he had to take a rib and create a female. Now we have a separation of male and female. And now we start to understand why, you know, these uh, concepts of a soulmate, why a male needs a female, a female needs a male to feel complete because it's been divided. And we're not like God anymore. It's, it's divided. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, and it just starts to make sense now. It's like, okay, so the whole first chapter, when people try to go through there and say, well, this is how creation happened. Well, it did, but on a spiritual level only. This was just uh, the Elohim laying out the format for creation, laying out the format for animals, laying out the format for man. He, he put the blueprints out there, and then Jehovah has to come along and do the actual work. And there is a concept that this part of God that we call the Elohim is so lofty, it cannot have any contact with matter. I mean, we are the lowest uh, level of this huge hierarchy, which is mostly a spiritual hierarchy where it starts at, you know, God, their creator at the very top and works its way down through all these spiritual beings and angels and all these things, which again, unfortunately, the Bible talks about but never explains it, but we can explain it. There's, uh, there's lots of explanations for all this, and we can explain it, you know, clear down to below our level. There are beings that are considered spiritual beings that are below our level. So if you go table tapping and using a Ouija board. These are the spirits you're talking to. It's not your grandma. It's not a higher being. It's a lower being that knows how to fake you out. 
<clears throat> All right, so, so there we've laid out this concept of time. We've laid out how this uh, happens uh, with that there are different aspects of God. And this is a sticky point for Christians that say, well, there's one God. There's God, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is probably male too. So, you know, it's like, so it becomes a sticky point when you use words like us and are. And, and even um, when you get to the create, uh, Jehovah, uh, there's plural terms about, you know, after, after Adam and Eve ate of the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, he says, oh, well, I'm paraphrasing, you know, we, we better uh, kick, kick them out or they might eat of the tree of life and then they'll become like us. Again, plural. Um, there, there's just so much here, but I, I'm trying. I'm painting in very broad strokes, just to that. To me, this is the foundation of spiritual work. This is the foundation of the Bible, and you need to get these concepts down to to move forward and learn some of these uh, these techniques for studying the Bible, watching words. I mean. Uh, when they when they wrote the Bible, they didn't change from the word God to the word Lord, Lord God because it sounded more interesting or, or to switch things up. There's a reason for that. And there's a definite clean break here. I mean, if, you know, they were just trying to throw in some variety, they would have done it sooner. But there's an obvious clean break there where this happens. And... Back to uh, the creation of heaven and earth. I mean, I mean, I think we've covered the the big the big ideas here. Um, I know I'm leaving a lot out, and like I say, I'm trying to paint in broad strokes. Uh, who's the artist that paints with dots? Emily, help me out. Sarah? Who? Sarah. Sarah. I mean, we could go back and do that for a hundred years and, and just on these first two chapters, but I'm, I'm just trying to lay a foundation, paint in broad strokes. This is how the universe gets created. This gives us our best look at how God operates. We're created in God's image. That tells us how we operate. It's the same thing. We have an idea and then we manifest that idea. I mean, wow. <laughs> well, we're given the blueprint for how our mind works right here and how the spiritual realm works. So um, I'm not sure how long I went, but I think I'm just going to wrap it up here. I think I've, I've covered enough to, to show. So in the beginning, I'll wrap up like this. In the beginning, the, it means that this round, when 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 the Elohim decided it was time to wake up from, from their rest, now we're starting over. And, and the Elohim breathes out in the, in the terms of the Hindus, you know. And then God, the Elohim. Again, we have to go to the Hebrews. This is a Hebrew book. Let's go to the ones that wrote it and try to understand these concepts. I mean, why not? and created the heaven and the earth. We've kind of covered that, that the Elohim laid out the blueprint, Jehovah did the actual creation. Do I understand the details? No. Do I need to? I don't think so. But it helps to have a, a grasp and a concept of, of just how beautiful a picture they lay out here, but how people don't, don't get it. Hey, it took me two years to sort through this. If I would have been doing this for college, this would have been my thesis. And, uh, you know, I was, like I said earlier, I went into this without preconceived ideas. I just wanted to know the truth. I wanted to understand Genesis. I think I finally did get a, a good enough concept to make sense of it. And, and that it lays a great foundation then for looking further into the Bible. But you got to start at the beginning. And, and in the beginning, that is what the word Genesis means. It's the beginning. So I thank you for your time. And uh, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up the message right there, and I'm sure I left out a lot. I've, I've ran this over in my mind a thousand times, and it comes out different every time, and, and it did today, too, but I think I've covered what I, what I really wanted to lay out, so I, I thank you for your time, and, and that's it. Thank you.